All right, sweet. We're not going to go in any uh, formal order. If you guys want to ask a question, go ahead. <clears throat> What's up? Um, any tips for like first thing in the morning workouts, like good habits, just to be efficient and like always say it's tough to work out. I just feel like I'm not disciplined enough to do that. Yeah. Um, are you more disciplined during the morning? I think I will be if I just do it. <laughs> yeah. The biggest thing for me working out early in the morning is just showing up. I, have, I don't think I've ever woke up in the morning and been like, oh, I can't wait to train right now. Uh, so just getting to the gym, getting under a, under a barbell, squatting an empty barbell uh, sucks. And then the next set sucks a little less, sucks a little less. And once I'm warmed up, I'm awake. Um, but literally just doing it, just getting into the gym, uh, that's the hard part. Once I'm, once I'm warmed up, the session's not bad. So uh, nothing to it but to do it. Ain't nothing to it but to do it. Uh, I mean, everything he said, I would say the only other thing I think of is if you have a training partner, sometimes that helps you with accountability where you're like, I can't say no to this person if they're showing up, you know what I mean? Or have them be like, all right, see you at uh, 6 a.m. You're like, ah. like you got to show up. So if you have that option, that could help. Um, but like he said, there's just self-discipline, you know, discipline's freedom. You know, Sir, what's up? any kind of rule of thumb for when you should start using belt deadlifts? Are you talking about... Uh, like big picture, like I just started lifting, when should I wear a belt? Or are you talking about like within a training session? Uh, within, well, just generally speaking. Yeah, um, well, to answer the, like within a training session, um, don't think it actually matters, but I do want to give you an answer. Um, I would say if I was doing uh, five sets of five with 315 and my last warm up was 275, I'd probably put it on then. Um, I like to put a belt on right before my working sets just to get a feel for it. Uh, so it doesn't you know, surprise me or throw me off on my working sets. Uh, so that's when I would suggest putting it on, maybe your last warm-up set. Um, as far as uh, when to start using a belt, if you just started lifting, it, again, it doesn't really matter, but to give you, I don't know, I don't really have an answer for that. Now, really, whenever you like. I don't think that there's a weight you know, requirement that once you get to 225, then you can wear a belt. Um, really, whenever you want. Whenever you feel like you can budget a, you know, a belt worth buying, do it, buy it. It usually takes four to 12 weeks to uh, buy, depending on who you buy it from. Uh, so don't have a great answer for you other than that. I kind of like it if uh, if you buy the belt and you have four to six weeks, you don't, you don't have the belt. So if you're new, you're training without the belt. And uh, I think for me personally and my clients, I like them working without a belt for just a little bit. Doesn't There's no set time frame, but if they can deadlift without a belt, I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't have the first day with them like, here, throw this on, we're gonna deadlift. I'd rather just see what they can do and then you know, eventually just have a belt. It's a good tool to have. For powerlifting purposes, do you think that it's useful in hypertrophy to be doing sets of 12 to 15 on deadlifts? You go first. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think at 12 to 15 reps, I think what's going to go first is your conditioning, not so much your, like, you know, your muscle. Uh, so I don't think I've programmed 12 to 15 sets for people. Reps. Yes. With, yeah, or, or, uh, Close, yeah. <laughs> Uh, reps uh, in that regard. Um, I think anywhere like eight to 10 would probably be uh, optimal, I would say, but I think most people would just be winded by that point that they're not actually focusing on the deadlift from where they're just out of breath and not conditioned. I don't, uh, I don't usually program 12 to 15 reps for a deadlift, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that uh, it's not a good idea or it's not useful. The further, the, the, the point of a hypertrophy block is usually the like build a whole bunch of volume, or if it's a GPP block, general physical preparedness, the point of all that is just to build up your work capacity uh, so that when you do start adding on a lot of volume for the competition lifts, you're conditioned. So 12 to 15 reps could certainly condition you. And I don't think that it's, the further out you are from a meet, the less precise you need to be. So if you're doing a hypertrophy block, there's no secret or, or there's no perfect set and rep range to say, Eights are better than tens, or better than twelves, or better than fourteen. It doesn't really matter. Like it, that's it's all kind of in the same ballpark of higher volume. So you certainly could do 15, 12 to fifteen reps. The whole volume and reps thing is just to monitor intensity. So if I was like, I want Kira lifting at a pretty low intensity, I'm gonna jack your reps up so you're not lifting very heavy. Um, and especially if you're far out from a parallel team meet, um, the goal again is just either conditioning or work capacity. Um, and 12 to 15 could certainly do it, but I don't usually, I'll usually do that stuff for Romanian deadlifts or maybe stiff leg deadlifts, um, but usually not competition deadlifts. That's just 
but not to say that you shouldn't. So, hope that's an answer. Um, so I've had the experience where a single cue that I learned from a coach um, has dramatically increased my lifting over you know a short amount of time by getting unstuck from form problems. And I was wondering if the two of you could talk about periods in your own training where you were stuck and uh, and you had the experience where you got unstuck by uh, by something like that. You, somebody told you the right thing and you realized something by the way you're living that they, they got you moving again. Um, I would say the I remember when uh, someone finally helped me with my bench that it initially like getting tight and actually the concept of an arch and digging your feet into the ground and getting really tight before you interact the bar. Um, that helped me initially, uh, but shortly after I got stuck for a while because just for programming issues. Um, but I would think more than any technique issue has been a programming issue um, that helped me the most. In fact, a lot of uh, when my whole training was kind of revamped when I uh, hired Austin, all of my stuff kind of went down. <laughs> my list went down because I was focusing on doing it the movement differently. Um, so it was the opposite. It didn't actually shoot me forward. It, it was like taking one step back in order to take two steps forward. Right. Um, but programming more than anything has helped uh, more so than technique issues. But the bench press, once someone kind of told me, stick your chest up and arch and, and get tight, that. That, helped, that helped immediately, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, in terms of an actual cue, it's probably heavy hands on the deadlift to take the slack out properly. Uh, I think I used to jerk the bar off the ground. Uh, so being able to have a smoother pull had helped, and it wasn't as wild or you know far out and just better bar path. Um, but kind of feedback on him with programming 100%. Uh, I used to run the same program over and over again, expecting a different result. Uh, so switching up, you know, with getting you know hiring him as my coach and helping me out really helped me understand. And I kind of like. I thought it would have like the opposite effect when he was like, you got a deadlift like three days a week. I was like, what? Like, this is different. Or focus just on the deadlift and not so much accessory work. I used to put like a ton of emphasis into like all these different accessory movements, um, but putting more focus into the main movements had really made a big difference in getting better at them. So that was definitely for me. What's up, Monica? I have a well, kind of a coaching question. Mm -hmm. so, That's probably a nuanced question, as some people like to say. But I would say, if they can deadlift, I would want them to deadlift. Yeah. And I would try different variations if they can't do that, like a competition deadlift, to get as close to the deadlift as possible um, without pain. So like Austin Baraki does a really good thing about pain, which everybody should check out, and what it is, and how to, like the pain protocol with clients and athletes. Uh, so that's something that I follow. Um, but at the end of the day, it's kind of getting them as close to doing what you know we can do as possible. So. If they're far out, you know, from doing a competition deadlift, can they do like a block pull, or can they do, uh, you know, an RDL or a stiff leg deadlift or something like that? And that is them doing the variation of the deadlift. We're gonna stick with that until it gets better. And usually things do heal, and we can get along our way. Um, but that's what I would do as a coach, and uh, just keeping them as compliant and wanting to train as possible too. Uh, it's kind of like my priorities in my head with that. If they, uh, if there's like a psychological issue to where they come to you and say like, you know, I got a bad back. I don't think deadlifts or I don't think I should be doing deadlifts. Um, you could, uh, you could start them with doing like trap bar pickups. I don't know, don't even call them deadlifts. Um, just to get them used to pulling. But if they're, uh, if you, like he said, if you can do uh, a rack pull from the knee, um, most people think that deadlifts are like 315 grinding out heavy singles. Uh, but you're like, no, you can scale it down and just, you can use a 15 pound bar in the rack. Like anyone can pull from the knee a 15 pound bar, you know? So you can, so start them really light, even much lighter than you think. Uh, and then as they build confidence, they're like, hey, this is, uh, I actually like this, or this isn't as bad as I thought it was. Um, rather than loading up a bar and like hoping they don't hurt themselves, you know what I mean? Just get like, get them really something easy to do. Um, uh, but oftentimes like, back issues that they have, 
um, kind of resolve themselves as they start weight training. Um, not only are they building a lot more confidence and saying like, I can actually do this where before I didn't think I could, um, they're also just getting stronger and these deadlifts are now more manageable. They're, as they train, their recovery gets better. They might say, yeah, I remember deadlifting one time at 24 hour fitness and oh man, I was wrecked for a week. Uh, but as they slowly get better at deadlifting, they're able to recover from that. Um, so everything improves, but yeah. Do you think there's any utility, utility to train one type of a deadlift, um, a different type of a deadlift that they usually do? Like for example, if you're a sumo quarter, would you recommend pulling conventional or vice versa if you're conventional pull sumo? How often do you do it And I realize it's individual, like, but like, mm -hmm. do you ever use it in your own programming? Uh, I think it all has its time and place depending on the athlete, what they're trying to do. I know it's kind of vague, but it's like, you know, some people will do like a washout block or something like that, or they'll do like if you're super far out, you know what I mean? Like for me to always pull conventional, but to switch it up completely to do sumo for a period of time, I don't think it's going to like negatively affect me. And, you know, it, it, I think they all just have their place in a certain time for every athlete. Obviously, if you have a com competition coming up and you're a conventional puller, you probably aren't going to be doing a lot of sumo deadlifts. Um, but if you... <laughs> you like have a year to kind of just experiment some stuff and you're like, hey, I just want to try sumo deadlifting. You know, I think that that's okay. Um, the more specific you get to something, the more you want to start doing, you know, what you want to get specifically good at. So that's kind of my take on it. But I don't want to say like sumo deadlifts are bad, you shouldn't do them. Like, I think everything has its, its place in somewhere. I don't think that, or I've never programmed for a, uh, conventional deadlifter. I've never programmed sumo deadlift outside of uh, like a pivot week, which is just a week where you do a bunch of different stuff or a pivot block. Uh, but I have programmed the conventional deadlift for sumo pullers. Um, I think that uh, what it comes down to is the best use of your time. And if someone was to tell me, I really want to improve my deadlift. Um, and I said, all right, I'm going to have this person deadlift twice a week. I'm going to have them conventional deadlift here and then sumo deadlift here. I probably wouldn't do that because I'd say there are other things that he or she could do that would better suit them. So I'll have them do a pause deadlift, a block pull, a deficit deadlift, because I think that's going to help more. Um, so it's usually a matter of, uh, you know, what they have time for and what suits their goal. Um, and so if that makes sense. Yeah. How can I develop a good diet where like, I'm still going to eat enough protein, but I'm not going to get the big belly I have that I've gotten. Like I want to get big, but I don't want to. Well, that's all ca that's all calorie management um, um, yeah like you got to figure out surplus deficit kind of thing um, but, yeah monitoring your macronutrients I don't understand those well, macro <laughs> <It's a nutrition laughs> class. macronutrients are carbs, protein, fat, micronutrients are vitamins, right. minerals. Um, but uh, so it's monitoring, monitoring calories is most important, not necessarily your carb intake and whatnot, uh, but monitoring your calories, your overall calories every day is going to be most important. But that's like, that's really individual. Um, yeah. If you have the, uh, there are all kinds of diet plans or uh, diet coaches online um, that I think would be much better suited to answer it than me. Uh, and so, yeah, this is like way too, way too individual to answer right now to say, hey, you need 2,600 calories and, you know, 195 grams of protein a day. You know what I mean? So, but it does come down to diet. You'll, ne you'll never out train a shitty diet. Yeah. Uh, being here at Untamed Strength, a prowler, uh, prowler or light strongman, uh, do a keg carry down, a sandbag carry. Uh, so just strongman, carry, just moving with weight in your hands. Uh, usually light at first. Um, again, kind of goes with compliance. Most people get a little more excited about doing that than uh, 30 minutes on a treadmill. But if that was what you wanted to do, that's fine. Some people are like, I like listening to podcasts and walking on an incline power walk treadmill and have them do that. So really it's like asking the client, what, what do you want to do for conditioning? Like what sounds cool? And if they're like, really like to try some strongman, I'm going to do that. 
Uh, if they say, I have a treadmill at home that I'd like to start using, then I'll, I'll do that. Um, so individual, like all these questions. Uh, for conditioning purposes, uh, I think everyone benefits from doing some sort of like, you know, 30 minute type of aerobic activity, whether it's like walking on a treadmill or jogging, there are different variations of that. But typically like you're only gonna better your health if you have at least like one or two days or something like that. Um, I wouldn't overdo it with that. Like I wouldn't go on tons of runs and stuff like that if your main focus is strength training. Um, but yeah, we do like sled work, sledge hammers, light tire flips, keg walks at my gym, all that kind of stuff. Um, something that keeps them moving at intensity where they still talk, uh, but they can't sing. It's kind of a good rule of thumb. Like if you're just like gasping for air, that's probably the wrong intensity um, that you're looking for. Um, so just something that keeps you moving and, you know, sweating and you like it. How useful have you found implements such as bands and chains have been increasing your overall squat and deadlift? Um, I think that, uh, again, it's just another, it's just a variation. Um, so for me, it kind of goes with compliance. Uh, I, I've been excited recently to like, use bands and use chains rather than, oh, I'm going to the gym to do pause deadlifts again. You know, I, so it's exciting for me um, uh, to incorporate it. I can't say directly like, Bands and chains have increased my normal lifts by this much, um, but it does motivate me. I enjoy training uh, with bands and chains. With that said, it can be, uh, bands can be helpful uh, for let's say the squat, for example, um, for like teaching someone to get to depth. Uh, one of the guys here really noticed it, that the band's pulling you down. And so once you get to the, you need to actually get to depth in order to deload that weight because if you stop early, there's still a lot of band tension, uh, and so you never really get to deload that weight. So it was kind of encouraging him to get lower so that he could deload the weight and then come back up. But anyways, that really wasn't your question. I can't tell you like exactly you know, X and Y it's increased this much, but I know that it's uh, made me look more forward to training because I, I've liked recently to use bands and chains and whatnot. There's no secret to it. It's just another variation, just like there's no secret to deficit deadlifts necessarily. It's just another variation. Just more pulling. Yeah, I'd agree. I think it's more of a motivational standpoint. Uh, it's a good thing to throw in, change it up, gets you excited to train. I don't know what it would actually like. I couldn't say, oh, the bands and chains are what has really switched up my deadlift. Like, I, I don't think that would be the case. Uh, I think it's fun to have them, fun to use them. And uh, yeah. Uh, this is probably the last thing. With that said, sometimes I'll use that stuff for, for the bench, for example, for clients. I'll have a Bench press day, uh, second bench press day might be a lighter variation. Like I'll have him do a close grip or an incline bench, which is going to be inherently lighter. Third day, I might have him do more of an overload bench, like a slingshot bench or a band bench uh, that would get heavier at the top. Um, so that's kind of how I program that stuff is my, my overload day would be with chains or bands. All right, cool. Thanks for coming out, guys. Thank you. Cool.